Um, for those of you who don't know, I for the last about eight months I've been working as a custodian uh, while I'm going to seminary. I've been doing that full time. And I gotta tell you, I never imagined once in my life that I will be doing that. Um, I don't know if some of you guys can relate with me. Some of you are maybe in jobs that you never imagined that you would ever be in or doing things that you would, yeah, anyways. But, um, and you know, I will say, as a pastor's kid, because my dad was also a pastor, I saw us, you know, when God was following, or when my dad was following God, and he's a pastor. I saw him do a lot of things. We were poor. He was struggling. He was cleaning things. And I was like looking at my dad and going, this is exactly the reason why I would never be a pastor. This is, you know, this is why I was like, God, if you're calling me to it, I don't want to do it, right? Does anyone relate with me on that, okay? And, and what I realized is that sometimes when God calls you into, to serve in ministry, he actually also calls you to suffer, and you'll see that a lot in scripture. When God calls you to serve him in ministry, also he's calling you to suffer for him. It's a little bit of a scary uh, introduction there. But, but throughout this uh, season of you know, the daily grind, going in there, cleaning things, I, you know, sometimes I'll see something dirty and I'll, you know, like, I'll be like, hey, who's going to clean that? And then you realize as a custodian that's actually you who's supposed to clean that. Um, you know, and as I'm going through this, uh, Joseph, the story of Joseph, when we've been in this series, uh, the story of Joseph has been such an inspiration to me and a source of hope. And uh, it strengthened me in my walk with God. And I cannot tell you how many times that when I was, felt like despairing in my life, going, is this what my life is going to amount to? Is this why I went to college? Is this why I worked so hard? Whenever I was in those moments of despair, Joseph has been such an encouragement to me. And I want this morning for it to be a source of encouragement to you. And I can honestly tell you that, um, man, actually I was supposed to preach this months ago. And when I was supposed to preach at that time, I was like, I'm going to back out, right? I I was like, you know, I'm I'm too scared to actually go up there and preach this at that time. Because I just wasn't, I wasn't in a good place. But right afterwards, I immediately felt regret, and I felt that God actually wants me to communicate this message to you guys and communicate the story of Joseph so that it would be an encouragement to you, and I hope that it will help shape your life in a way that looks more and more like Joseph, but also like Christ. So this morning, from the life of Joseph, I have one point and one point only. Following God is about who God is not about what he's done for me lately. I'll say that again. Following God is about who God is, <clears throat> not about what he's done for me lately. Let's pray together. Heavenly God, Lord, um, we just want to come before you this morning. And I just pray, Lord, at this moment, would you help us, Lord, to reconfigure our minds and See you, Father, who, for who you really are. Not as just our source of help, not as just, <clears throat> not just coming before you when we need something, Lord, but help us to see how precious, how beautiful, how glorious, how holy you are, Lord. And help us, Father, on our knees this morning to worship you with, in spirit and in truth. And help us, Lord, to reconfigure our lives to your will, to your word, and help us, Father, to live the life of Jesus to everyone around us. And Lord, would you make us from the inside out, Father, changed to be pleasing to you in your sight. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 39, Genesis 39. I don't know. I'm, I've been sick for the last couple of weeks, uh, so pray for me that I don't like start going on a coughing fit. Uh, are any of you sick? Yeah? Okay. I don't feel as alone. All right. <clears throat> so, bear with me. So, in Genesis chapter 39, so where is Joseph at right now? Joseph is about 17 through 18 years old, and he has gone from 
you know, just put yourself in Joseph's shoes. He's gone from being the favorite son of his father Jacob, which is a, it's a mess, right? If you show favoritism as a parent, but to, from his favorite son to being betrayed by his own brothers, thrown into a pit, sold, and he's probably traumatized. I would venture to say you would probably be traumatized if you had gone through that with your family, right? He has lost his, his family. And it's not like you and me when today, like, you know, a lot of us at, at the age of 18, we're like ready to go, ready to get away from our parents. Sorry, parents. Uh, we're like, you know, we want to be alone. We want to go to college and experience independence. It's not like that. It's not like getting married and forming your own family. He is literally betrayed and sold by his family. And in that day, for especially in the nomadic cultures uh, like the Jews were, uh, family was everything that you have. It was your identity. It's who you are. It's your security. It's your life purpose. If my father is a shepherd, I'm going to be a shepherd. We can't relate with that in our culture very well, but that's where Joseph was. So he lost everything at the age of 17, 18 years old. And now he's in Egypt and he's experiencing a completely different culture. He's a country kid in the big city. Like some of us, and I see a lot, of, our church has a lot of second generation, 1.5 generation immigrants. Uh, either you or your parents have come from a different country to America. Joseph is an immigrant. He doesn't know the language, and he's coming in from a completely different culture into Egypt, and he's not coming as a tourist. He's not coming in hey, let's let's be a big baller and like spend a lot of money, go buy this, go have fun. No, he's coming in as a slave. He's a property of someone else. He doesn't belong to himself anymore. And as we read in the beginning of chapter 39, Joseph is sold to Potiphar, the captain of the guard of the Pharaoh. So put yourself in his situation. You lost everything. Everything's in you. And you don't even have your freedom to do what you used to do. That's where Joseph is at. And as we dig into the chapter, chapter 39, chapter 39 can be divided into three sections, okay? Just before we even start, I want you guys to kind of form a structure in your mind. This helps me conceptually. So chapter 39, first section goes from verse 1 through verse 6. Okay, verse 1 through verse 6. Second section is from verse 7 through verse 20. And third section is verse 21 to 23. Okay, so if you, I don't know if you're okay. Some of you guys have smartphones. Uh, if you, I'm, I'm more old school. If you want to mark your Bible, chapter 39, you could do that. Okay, is those three sections. And when you look, section 1 and section 3, <clears throat> let's read verse 2. And I'll also read verse 21, okay? Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now turn to verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him steadfast love, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Does that sound similar to you guys? The Lord was with Joseph. Both of those sections start with the same thing. They're similar. Now, you and I know from Scripture, we know from, because we have this, the, the word that we can read that and say, oh, the Lord was with Joseph, right? But if you're Joseph, would you know that the Lord was with you? We know, but if you're Joseph and you're in the middle of the mess, in your own life, do you always feel like the Lord is with you? Joseph didn't have scripture like we do. Joseph might have heard stories from his father, from his granddaddy, about what God did in the life, in their life, but he didn't have scripture like we did. And we don't ever, throughout this entire story of Joseph, we never see God directly talking to Joseph. We see him doing that with Jacob, right? We see him talking to Abraham, his grand, or his great grandfather, I guess, but we never see him directly talking to Joseph. And The only thing that we really see is sometimes that Joseph will have dreams and that he has the ability to interpret dreams. It is awfully quiet this morning. (laughs) So, um, anyways, if you guys, if there's anything you like, just 
you know, amen, something, okay. All right. <clears throat> you know, it's been a while, so I'm a little rusty. I'm getting it going, okay. <laughs> okay, so on top of all this, in chapter 39, Joseph goes from um, a bad situation, being in a pit, to being sold, right? So he goes into being a slave, and by the end of the chapter, he goes from being a slave to being in prison. So it's not like the situation is getting any better for Joseph. And in those kinds of situations where he thinks he's trying, he's trying to follow the Lord, and the things that keep getting worse, would you, if you were Joseph, believe that the Lord was with you? I mean, you and I would think that if the Lord's with us, things would get better, right? It should get better. It should be the happy ending that we all picture, right? But it's the opposite. But what's amazing about Joseph is how he responds, not like me, it's how he responds, because I would be like, why God? But uh, Joseph, how he responds to a bad situation, that's the remarkable part. He doesn't, he's not crippled by despair. You never see Jesus, uh, Joseph going, woe is me, and just rotting away. So let's look at this. So in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. So we see that instead of being, of just despairing, Joseph worked hard in the situation that God put him in. He worked hard and God was with him, so he became successful, right? And then in verse 3, it says, read your Bibles, if his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. His master saw, right, that the Lord was with him. That's a challenge. Just, I just want to pause right there. That's a challenge to me, and it should be a challenge to us. When you're working, I know some of you guys are students and college students, we have a lot of them, but if you are working for a boss, no matter what job it is, is the manner in which you work causing your boss to see that the Lord is with you? Are you reflecting Christ at your work in such a way that he thinks, he or she thinks, hey, there's something very special and different about this guy or this lady? Guys, we need to work in a way that reflects Christ in all of our life, not just at church. Let's continue reading. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Now, let's read verse 5. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So the Lord blesses Potiphar, this non-believer's house, this Egyptian's house. Why? Because of Joseph. He blessed the Egyptian for Joseph's sake. Some of you guys are in a type of work that's very stressful, that can be very difficult, and just the daily grind gets at you. But in those moments where you feel like, hey, this is, I feel like I'm in a pit, realize God wants to use you at your work in those places of darkness to be his light. And the, who knows, if you work in such a way that reflects Christ, he might use you to bring, to change the environment. Like God used Joseph, and because on account of Joseph, he blessed Potiphar. Some of you guys are, in, are teachers in really bad schools or tough neighborhoods. Don't give up. In those moments, realize that God through you can change your work situation can change your environment and be challenged by that. So in between, so we'll kind of, we'll dig into section three in a little bit, but as you see, section one and section three are similar. It says the Lord was with him and he blessed him and the Lord was with him and he blessed him. And so we have these three similar sec or two similar sections, and sandwiched between these two sections, this introduction and this conclusion, is section two. And section two, in this section two, there is the main event, the, the scandalous story. I'm not sure if you have heard of it, of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. I mean, if you grew up in the church, you probably heard it. Actually, I don't know. Is that appropriate? 
to teach in children's school? I'm not sure when I learned it, but, um, <clears throat> but you've heard the story before, right? And most of the time when someone preaches on it or teaches on it, it's about flee from sexual temptation. You know, if you're tempted and here's the situation, run from it. That's usually what you hear about it. But this morning, what I want you to focus on is not so much on the temptation itself, even though it is kind of funny and you can get some stuff. And it's true, but what I want you to focus on is the character of Joseph. What I want you to focus on is, on is what kind of man Joseph was. Because before even this situation came about, he had to train himself, you know, he had to train himself for that moment for those situations. You don't just, like, for me, I'm going off the trail here, but for me, I can't just get up tomorrow and run a marathon. Like, look at me. I'm like, I've gained a lot of weight since I got me. Like, I'm not ready for that. I can at most run three miles on the, on the treadmill, okay? I am not running in a, on a marathon. And same thing with, with these kinds of temptations or situations. You're not going to just all of a sudden be ready to go. If, you're, if you have not already made yourself alert and aware and have trained yourself to walk in the, in the way of the Lord, and when these kinds of situations come, you will not be ready. Don't be fooled. So, this is where it gets kind of interesting. And if you're bored this morning, I hope that this section kind of amuses you. I don't know what... what well, how, how, to, how to frame this, okay? So, <clears throat> let's continue. So, in verse 6, in the latter part, it says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. This is the only part I believe, uh, George, you might know, but this is the only part I believe in that p- handsome in form and appearance is used in regards to a male, okay? But every other part, it was usually for women, including his mom, okay? So, apparently, beauty and good looks runs in the family, okay? For Joseph, but so he is handsome. Now he's a stud. Okay, I, I don't know why I keep saying that word. If there, if it's an old word and you have a better word for me, just tell me. But so Joseph is hot. He's a stud. Okay. And I just imagine, you know, in the Egyptian sun. Some of you guys, you, you guys have all had you know history class. You probably know. But I just imagine Joseph out in the sun, and he's like, you know, he's working you know, doing his stuff, and he probably has got his shorts on, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking his shorts, okay, and I can imagine Potiphar's wife, okay, she's just like out on the side, chilling by, you know, by a pool, and just tanning out, and she has her maid servants probably like fanning her, you know what I mean, and then like, and then you, she just sees Joseph with all his muscles just glistening in the sun, right? You know what I mean? All his muscles, just like as he's working. And she's probably, it says that she casts her eye on him. Okay? She casts her eye on him. And it says, in verse 7, And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Big Joe and sorry, I lost my foot, and said, lie with me. Lie with me. In our modern day, it might be, you want to come over for net, watch Netflix and chill? And that's not about Netflix. For those of you who have never heard that, I'm not going to go further into it. But if you think only modern women, women of our times, our society, it, uh, uh, hmm. if you only think modern women are direct, uh, yeah, here's a... <laughs> Here's an Egyptian woman in ancient Egypt who's very direct about what she wants. So she comes on this strong, and now let's take a step back. Notice here in that in chapter 39, okay, so I'm, there's going to be moments where we kind of go into the fun and then we'll also go into the nerd, okay? So just bear with me. In chapter 39, if you take a step back, notice here, uh, I want you to actually scan. Scan real quick. How many times do you read the word Potiphar? Notice, Potiphar. Take a quick scan. There's one in the beginning of the chapter, right? And afterwards, if I'm correct, my eyesight didn't go bad. Uh, Potiphar is only mentioned once. After Potiphar is mentioned once, it always says his master. Potiphar... And she's not, you know, this lady is not re- referred to as Mrs. Potiphar or by her first name. It says his master, right? After Potiphar is mentioned, it says his master. And after that, 
he, they call her his master's wife. Now, why? Why is that important? This being called master and master's wife in their relationship with Joseph, it emphasizes the difference in their relationship and their socioeconomic class. It, it, it makes it obvious for you that Potiphar or his master is here and Joseph is a slave and he's here, right? And that likewise, Potiphar's wife is also in that same category of being here in comparison with Joseph. He's a slave. Slaves cannot really say no. So Joseph here in this situation is caught in a catch-22. He's caught in a bad situation. If he actually followed what his master's wife says, then he'll be in sin against God. But if he keeps saying no to her, then... Who knows what's going to happen to him, considering that she has all the power over him. She can starve him, right? She can, make, she can punish him. She can make things difficult for him. Like the saying goes, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Okay, that was like, okay. But what's interesting here in this passage, in the, this, this situation, it says that his master's wife, only says three words to him in English. It's in three words. In Hebrew, it's actually two. But so he, she says, lie with me, right? And when he, she says, lie with me, Joseph just responds, does he just say no? Look at the passage. No, he goes into this whole rational, long soliloquy about why he can't sleep with her. Ladies, imagine. I'm not saying you will do this, okay? Please do not go and tell a man, lie with me, okay? But... If you actually went up to a man and said, lie with me, would you expect him to give a whole long list, laundry list of reasons why that, is not, that cannot happen? Like, why can't Joseph just say, no, I can't? Simply put, and if you read in this section, he starts out saying, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So, simply put, it's this. Joseph understood that there's no such sin, no such thing as a sin, that's just a personal sin. There's no such thing as it's my body, my choice, I can do what I want, and it's not going to affect anybody else. Sin itself is not personal. It's not just personal. It doesn't just affect you. He understood that if he sinned and went with uh, Mrs. Potiphar, that it's going to affect horizontally his relationship with his master, who by all accounts up to this point has been good to him, and it's going to also affect his vertical relationship with God. Because it is a sin against God, more importantly. Let me give you an example. I don't know, some of you guys might come from a broken family or might have heard stories about broken families. But when a husband, me being a husband, this is what I can relate to. If a husband cheats on his wife and commits adultery, does it just affect the husband? No, right? It affects his wife. It affects his kids. It affects his community, his in-laws. It affects uh, his church. It doesn't matter if you did it in the secret because most things eventually will come out to the light. And when it does, it doesn't just, it doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone around you. And on top of that, Joseph emphasizes this in verse 9 because he calls it he doesn't just say, he doesn't dumb it down. He says it's a great wickedness against God. It's a big sin. It's a dramatic, it's a huge thing. Guys, do you see sin in your life? Do you try to minimize it and make it into a small thing? Oh, that's just a, you know, that's just a quirk I have. Or do you, actually, uh, do you actually see sin in the ways that God sees sin? That's important. 
Do you see sin in your life in the way that God sees your sin? Now, I would venture to say Mrs. Potiphar was probably a very attractive woman. Just going off into the non-serious a little bit. She probably had the latest and greatest fashion. She probably could have been in, what is that called again? Um, the Real Housewives show. She probably, if they had a reality show, she probably could have been in the Real Housewives of Egypt, okay? She probably had a great tan, I'm guessing, right? She was probably a very attractive woman. But, <clears throat> you know, on top of it, if Joseph actually hooked up with Mrs. Potiphar, it probably would have given him some advantages. It might be his ticket to success, his ticket to get whatever he wanted, right? Networking, we call it in business, right? And on top of that, to make it worse, in verse 10 it says that she came after him day after day after day. Not just one. They're like, if you first time you're like, no, I won't do it. And then the next day, no, I won't do it. Can you imagine daily sexually being harassed daily? This is, a, I would say this is a case of male sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, daily. And we forget, how old is Joseph in this story? Maybe at this point, maybe 18, 19, uh, maybe 19, 20 years old. A couple years after he's been sold. Uh, guys in this room, how smart and how wise and how self-controlled were you at the age of 19? Like, Joseph is in the middle of his prime, of his hormone growth, right? He's a young, strapping, virile man, right? And daily, he's being approached by a woman. Do you, don't you think that Joseph might have wanted the comfort of a woman? Don't you think, you know, if he's in that kind of situation and he's in despair, don't you think he might have said, you know what, maybe once. But instead, it says that he avoided her. He ran away from her. He wouldn't be with her. He wouldn't stand close to her. And then on top of that, if you look at verse 11, it says, He went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house. So this is an opportunity where he could have sent in secret. No one would know. No one would know. Now what's interesting about chapter 39 is that right before chapter 39, there's chapter 38. And in chapter 38, there's another story about sexual temptation. If you've, if, if you've read the chapters, if you've read Genesis. Uh, who is in that chapter? Judah, his brother, another one of... Jacob's boys, right? And whenever he is put in a sexual temptation situation, uh, Judah falls under temptation. He actually sleeps with his daughter-in-law, which I'm not going to go further into, but that's, hey, and who, who, Judah is the great, great, great ancestor of David, who is the great, 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 great ancestor of Jesus. So that's Judah. So, the author here is juxtaposing Judah in chapter 38 with how different he is with Joseph, who also gets put into a sexual temptation situation, and he flees from it. He runs away from it. He refuses, he runs, he bolts, and possibly, because it says that Mrs. Potiphar grabbed his garment, I mean, possibly he could be just like streaking out Okay, streaking out of the home. I'm guessing they had a mansion. But on a side note, if you read Second uh, Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-two, Paul instructs Timothy. He's also about you know he's a young buck, right? He's young, and he instructs him: flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee from sexual temptation. Flee from the desires of your, of your youth and pursue, run towards righteousness. It's not good enough, guys, if you just run away. You've got to have something you run to. You've got to have something that you run towards. Joseph runs away from Potiphar's wife, but he's running to God, no matter what the consequences are. Some of you guys are on a day-to-day -day basis struggling with sin in your life, hidden sin, and you, you keep running into the same scenario. 
You keep doing the same old things, being around the same old people, in the same environment, and you expect something different to happen. No, you need to run away from that, and you need to run to God. That's the only way. Like, yes, God has the power to change you. Yes, he has the power to shape your situation in a different way, but he still wants you to be wise and run away from it because that's what repentance means. Run away and run to God. Now, real quickly, let's look at how Potiphar's wife, so she just got totally uh, turned down, right? Like, to such a degree that he, Joseph would streak out uh, rather than be with her, okay? Now, that's going to hurt her pride, I'm guessing, uh, as a woman. Okay, but, so what does she do? In verse 14, So she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. A Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. So what, what does Potiphar's wife call Joseph in this situation to the other servants? A Hebrew. So she was bringing racism. In, so she's appealing to the servants who are in the same class, same level as Joseph, saying, look at this Jew. This Jew is doing this to us. So she appeals to racism. And if you go on further into the story, um, Potiphar comes home, her husband comes home, and she says to him, uh, your Hebrew slave or your Hebrew servant made a mockery of me. So why would she say that? Because if she, if she says to slaves, hey, this slave did this to me, then she can't get them on her side. But with Potiphar, she's saying this Hebrew, this racially different from us, and on top of that, a slave, you're the master, you're the man, you're the husband, you're supposed to get, you're supposed to own this. Like, they're not supposed to do this to your wife. So she's appealing to that. Notice, there's a lot of subtle things in there that you need to know. Racism isn't new. Racism isn't just for uh, the last 500 years. Racism has been around for a very, very, very long time. And on top of that, socioeconomic class, looking down on people who are poor or of a different social status than you, that isn't new either. That has been around since the beginning of time. So we see that here. Notice how quickly Potiphar's wife goes from loving him, wanting him. Uh, you know, being a Hebrew or being a slave didn't seem to bother her before when she, when she desired him. But all of a sudden, she quickly changes. And all of a sudden, now that's an issue. People turn their back on you very, very quickly. Be careful about uh, women or men who come to you who has honey on their lips, right? Run away from that. Don't believe that. Be wise. So in verse 20, it says, Joseph's master was furious and puts him in prison. Now, that's the, that's the story, right? Joseph did the right thing. Joseph made all the right choices. He worked hard. He did the right thing. And what does he get back in return? Isn't things supposed to get better? If you do the right things, if you work hard, isn't it supposed to get better? Isn't life supposed to be fair? Instead, instead of getting better, things get worse. And Joseph is put in prison, prison falsely accused. Now, you might be wondering, where is God in all this? If you're Joseph, you would say, God, where are you? Don't you care? Let's read the final section of this chapter <clears throat> where it says, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all, that, all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. Same thing as the first section. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. Joseph was in a pretty crappy situation. 
but the Lord was with him and he blessed him. Now, let's wonder, to, let's question ourselves. Why? Why was the Lord with Joseph? He wasn't, he wasn't like, the Lord wasn't with Judah, Joseph's brothers, like he was with Joseph. What's the difference about Joseph? Why was he so different? Why did God choose him to use him? Because we, we would say we want to be like Joseph, right? Would you say you want to be like Judah? We can, we can know from Scripture that, of course, it is because of the loving kindness of God, the hesed of God, right? That God is faithful, that God is loving, that he is steadfast, right? The steadfast love. Because of that, that's why God was with Joseph. And that's true, 1,000% true. But I also believe that Genesis 39 shows us that it's because Joseph was a man who was totally sold out to God. As much as God was committed to Joseph, we also see here that Joseph was fully committed to God. No matter what price, no matter what situation, no matter how bad things were, Joseph had integrity in the difficult times. He had integrity in the secret places of your life. Do you have integrity in the secret places of your life where no one can see you, where, where no one knows? Do you have integrity? Are you sold out to God in those times, in those situations? Joseph's response to the daily temptation of Potiphar's wife tells us not to sin. Why? Not based on how we feel. Your feelings are important. important. Don't, don't get me wrong, okay? But his ch decision not to sin is not based on how he feels, not based on the situation, not based on if God gives him what he wants. We, as Christians, like Joseph, we don't, we, we don't sin not based on these kinds of things, but because of who God is. Because of who he is. We choose not to sin because of who God is, because God is altogether worthy of our worship. Even if he doesn't do a single thing for me, God is who he is, and he is worthy of our worship. Because he is holy. Because he is loving. Because he is merciful. Because he is with us. Because he gave himself for us. Because he is who he is, therefore we choose to follow him. This might seem like a very simple key point or whatever to you this morning, but it's so hard to follow. Some of you suffer because you have, a, you have too small of an image of God. In your mind, God is someone like a lucky Buddha that you just rub his uh, little belly, you know, have you ever seen those in the Chinese restaurant? But anyways, you just rub his belly and it's for good luck. Then that's your picture of God or like a genie. That when you want something, you just ask God for whatever you want. You might not say that verbally, but in terms of in your mind's eye, that's how you might, you might be seeing him. And that's not God. He's not obliged to us. He doesn't owe us anything. How many of you have ever heard Romans 8.28, and a lot of people quote it, even non-Christians quote it, right? We hear, and we know that God works all things for the good. Pause. People have said that. Have you, have you heard that before? God works all things for our good. Does, has anyone actually read after that section? For good for what? The actual passage says, God works for the good of those who love him, and who are called according to his purpose. He is good to those who, he makes everything good and bad work out for the good for those who love him and who are committed to him. Look, God loves everybody. But not everyone loves God. And that's the reality. Joseph loved God. He followed God. He trusted and obeyed God. God. Guys, the reason why this, and I'm going off here, but the reason why this is so important to me is because when I accepted the call to be a pastor, I didn't want to suffer. I didn't want to clean. I didn't want to be a custodian. I didn't want to be poor. And when God didn't 
when he put me in this kind of situation and didn't give me the kind of things that I wanted, that I desperately, think about it. I grew up with a father who couldn't provide wealth for his family and we suffered and we were poor and we didn't know when, how we're going to make the next uh, rent, pay our rent or where the food's coming from. We didn't know. I didn't want to have that for my family. I didn't want to have that for my kid and my wife. And for me, that made me feel the most insecure as a man knowing that I couldn't do that. No matter how desperately I tried, no matter how hard I worked, no matter how hard I clean on a daily basis, I can't provide for my family. And in that moment, I have a choice to say, am I going to follow God? Am I going to trust him? Am I going to keep doing the right thing? Or am I just going to say, screw it? And our society would say, if you're put in that kind of situation, that you're a failure. You go on Facebook, you compare yourself. I'm I'm a custodian. I don't put on my profile employment, custodian at DTS. I don't do it. Why? Because I compare myself to other people in other situations, to doctors, to lawyers, to whatever. Guys, as Christians, we need to redefine the way that we think about success and how we define success. That's what it comes down to. Success for a Christian in a Christian's life is not about our getting what we want. It's not about self-actualization, if you've heard that. It's not about becoming the dream you. It's about the actualization of God's will for your life. Success is the actualization of God's will, what he wants, what he desires, as an all-loving God for your life. That's success for a Christian. And that's not popular to say. Some of you guys, I might be irking you the wrong way right now. And that's fine, because this is according to Scripture. That's the way that we look at it. Look, there will be times in your life when you'll be so beaten up spiritually that you'll be so discouraged emotionally. You'll be just tired, and you'll just want to throw in the towel and just say, screw it. But in those kinds of times, guys, may Joseph's story of being a slave of being in prison, of being rejected, all these different things. May his story serve to remind you to be faithful to God no matter what the situation is like. Not based on what he's done for you lately. God, what have you done for me lately? No, but based on who God is. Because as much as you or I Where Joseph can be faithful to God, we have to remember, our faithfulness is nothing compared to how faithful God is to us. It's nothing. Just think about this in this story. When Joseph was betrayed, where was God? God was there. When Joseph was sold, God was there. When Joseph was tempted, God was there. When he suffered injustice, time and time again, God was there. When Joseph was thrown in prison, God was there. And guess what? We know from later on in the story that Joseph learning how to manage the home of Potiphar and learning how to manage uh, the prison, what is God shaping him? How is he changing him and molding him to be the viceroy of Egypt, to learn how to manage a country? Don't Don't belittle the things and the responsibilities that God has put in your life right now. Be faithful in that. Work hard in that. Seek to honor him in that. See your work as everything that you do as worship. In your eating and your drinking, it's worship. But if that, if what God did in the story of Joseph is not enough for you, God became a man. God himself, the Holy One, altogether different. He became a man. And Jesus, the God-man, was also betrayed by one of his closest friends. Jesus was also forsaken by all the ones that he poured his life into. Jesus was also sold for 30 shekels of silver. He, like Joseph, was uh, tempted by Satan. Jesus was tempted. It's not like he didn't have any temptations. He was a single guy in his 30s, okay? He was tempted, but he refused to sin against God, no matter what Satan offered him. Jesus suffered injustice in the hands of the Jews and the Romans. And ultimately, Jesus 
was crucified for your sins and my sins and Joseph's sins. And he reconciled his brothers back to God. In his suffering, he reconciled us. I'm reminded of that fateful night in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus, sweating blood, can you imagine how much torment you must be to be sweating blood in prayer? I don't even sweat in prayer, let alone sweat blood. But Jesus, sweating blood, prayed, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus didn't, guys, he, didn't, he wasn't looking forward to going on the cross and dying. He wasn't like, let's get this over with, you know, like, I got this. No, he was saying, I don't want this, God. This is going to be painful, God. I don't want to go through this, God, but I will go through it for you. Because of who, who you are. Jesus followed God for who he is, not based on circumstances. And he followed God into pain, into suffering. Even when, it, when, even when he knew that everyone, including God for a while, would forsake him. That kind of resilience and perseverance. All so that you and I may have life. All for us. All so that you and I can come here together thousands and thousands of years later and still worship him. Where would we be if Jesus chose to just peace out? And as God lifted Joseph from a slave and from prison to become the viceroy of Egypt, God also lifted Jesus to the highest place so that every knee would bow, every tongue confess in heaven and on earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We know that from Scripture. We know Jesus where he is right now. My single challenge to you today is that like Jesus, like Joseph, you and I, let us persevere in following God for who he is and not how your situation is right now. Not, how, not if things are good or bad, not based on that kind of situation, but for just for who he is. Love him for who he is. And I guarantee, guys, that suffering will come. For all of us. There's no person in here that will not go through suffering. So all of it, even if you're a young buck at the age of 15 or 14 or whatever, you know, we have the teenagers here. But one day, things will happen. And in that moment, remember to follow God for who he is. I leave you with <clears throat> one passage in James chapter 1, 2 through 4. And this has been another passage that has meant a lot to me. So I'm just sharing with you what I'm going through. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Let perseverance do its work. Consider it all your suffering as joy in the light of eternity. Let's pray.